Good morning. It is so good to see you. I hope you are enjoying the beautiful sunshine as much or more than I am. Today's lesson is an answer to a request. Have you been baptized? But that's not really that's not really the point that I'm interested in our making this morning. What I'm interested in is have you been baptized the right way? Because there are lots of baptisms that take place in our world that are called baptisms that are not. Because the word baptize means to immerse. Sprinkling is not baptism. Pouring is not baptism. Immersion is baptism. And so one of the questions then is, have you been baptized the right way? Secondly, have you been baptized for the right reason? This is important because many people are encouraged to be immersed, but not for the reason given in Scripture, but for a different reason. And we'll look at those in just a few moments. And then third, have you been baptized into the church Jesus built? You see, a person can be baptized into a religious organization that began 300 years ago and does not go back to the New Testament for its guidance and its practices. And so these are very important questions that many people don't even ask. They just say, have you been baptized? Yeah. What does that mean? Was it done the right way according to Scripture? Was it for the right reason according to Scripture? And it was it into the church that Jesus built? Or was it into some human organization that has been made and developed since that particular time? Now, I have done some research. I have contacted uh, Facebook about, I mean, the uh, Internet about the beliefs of several congregations in Inola. And what I have discovered is that five of the religious groups meeting here today in Inola do not believe in baptism in order to have sins forgiven. They believe in baptism for another reason. Some of them do not believe in immersion. Some believe that sprinkling is okay. But I'm not giving you this because I have dreamed it up. I'm telling you this because I have actually got on the internet, checked out the source of these organizations' authority, read what they have said, and only that's what I'm bringing to you. In fact, I even found one organization called the Fellowship of Christian Athletes that has the same doctrine in its basic foundation. It's called the Four. The Gospel explained in four simple truths. Number one, they teach that God loves you. Do I agree? Yes, I do. They teach, number two, sin separates me from God. Do I agree? Of course I agree, because that's what Scripture teaches. Number three, they teach that Jesus rescues you. Is that true? Yes, it is. But I want to share with you what they say for number four. I'm not going to read it all. It's a paragraph, but I'm going to read a little bit of it. It talks about giving our life to Jesus. And I read, this involves agreeing that you are sinful, accepting God's forgiveness, and turning away from your sins and toward God. He chose to trust, he chose you to choose to trust Jesus. You trust Jesus when you believe and confess that Jesus is Lord and surrender your life to him. And then it asks the question, are you ready to place your trust in Jesus? However, I want you to notice that there is no mention of the church Jesus built in any of these statements. There is no mention of baptism in any of these statements that are made. I'm not being unfair to this organization. I'm just telling you what they teach with no reservation. Nothing mentioned about the church and nothing mentioned about baptism. In fact, last week at Poppin' Gigi's, a man got up and as he was leaving, he said, Preacher, I'll tell you what my favorite verse is. Truly I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise, and I believe in deathbed confession. But there again was no mention of the church that Jesus built. There was no mention of baptism. This is common in our community because people have not been taught what the church 
Jesus built really is. They have not been taught what baptism actually accomplishes. So I want to begin with the implications of this idea that we can have a personal relationship with Jesus, the head, separate and apart from the church that he came to build. Baptism in water then is taught as not being necessary for salvation. But the question that is commonly asked in these churches when someone is baptized is this. Do you believe that God, for Jesus' sake, has, not will, but has forgiven you of your sins? This is based upon the concept that the person received Jesus as their Savior, and later, because they have been saved, choose to be baptized to enter a particular church, and baptism, from that perspective, and I quote, is an outward sign of an inward grace. That is not what the Bible says about baptism, but that is what is said about baptism even in our own community. Please, do not take what I'm saying is unkindness. I'm only telling you what I know to be true because it is written down. I have read it on their doctrines and statements of faith on the internet. I know these things to be true. This baptism is not to share in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, Romans 6, 3, and 4, nor is it to receive the forgiveness of sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, because they believe those things have already happened before baptism ever took place. Here is that concept and what it looks like pictured. As an example, the little white dot there represents someone who is lost. The circle represents the area of being saved. Now, this person is taught that once you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, you are now saved, but you're not in a church. As an example, there may be a church represented by the yellow circle. There may be another church that teaches something different represented by the cross figure. There's another church that teaches something different, represented by the triangle. And then there's another church that teaches something different, represented by the diamond. So now, as a saved person, this doctrine teaches, you can stay outside of any church if you like. However, you may choose to become a member of a church that immerses you to become a part of it, you may choose to become a member of a church that says sprinkling is all you need to do. You could become a member of a church that says you can be sprinkled, you can have water poured on you, you can be immersed, or not at all, the choice is yours. And then, of course, the church that's left is doesn't even say anything about baptism at all. And there are churches in our world, I'm not aware of any here in town, but I'm aware of some in Tulsa that don't even say anything about baptism in one form or another. Here is what denominationalism looks like, folks. We are one church among hundreds. All different, all following Christ, some bringing things out of the Old Testament, some bringing things out of paganism, some omitting things taught in the New Testament, but we're just one of a hundred. That's denominationalism. But that's not the New Testament church. Let's go a little bit further into this and look first at what Bible baptism actually is. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5 makes one of the most important statements we can understand about baptism. It says there is one baptism. How do we know what it looks like? How do we know what it is? What, how do we know what happens? We have to go to the Word of God and there learn it. Number one, Jesus commanded it. 
Matthew chapter 28 and verse 18. He said, Go and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So first of all, it is a command. It is a command given to us by Jesus. In Acts chapter 8, verses 38 and 39, and I would like to read these to you. It is, he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. Literal translation. They both went down into the water, and he immersed him. That's what the word means. The King James translators were weary and wary and cautious about translating that word as to what it means because King James did not believe in immersion. King James believed in sprinkling. Therefore, this word never was translated out of the original language, but they took the Greek letters, changed them into English letters, and that's what the word baptism is today in our English language. The verse continues. When they came up out of the water. You get two things here. When I asked the question, were you, how were you baptized? The question was, were you immersed in water? Because that is how the baptisms were done in the New Testament. And if we want to be true to the New Testament, to the church that Jesus built, that's what we will do. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, we find that one of the pre-requirements, prerequisites of baptism is that we have faith based upon the Word of God. I want you to listen to these verses. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. Peter has just preached a sermon to them, and they have said in verse 37, What shall we do? And he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. In Acts chapter 8 and verse 12, Philip preached the word to them, and they believed and were baptized. In Acts chapter 16, verses 30 through 32, the Philippian jailer now released, now takes Paul and Silas out of the prison, and he says to them, what must I do to be saved? And he said, you have to believe. And then he preached the words of Jesus to him, and then he was baptized. So one of the first things that's required to be baptized biblically is to believe. And that belief needs to come from the word of God, and it believes to believe the message. It means to believe the message about Jesus and his kingdom, the church. Further, what else is required before baptism? The willingness to turn from my way of living and my own way of living to God's way of living. It's called repentance. Peter said in Acts 2.38, Repent and each one of you be baptized. In Acts chapter 26 and verse 20, he said, I preach repentance and turning to God. That's a part of what is necessary before I am baptized. This is one reason that infants aren't baptized. This is one reason why children who are not old enough to be responsible for their own sins are still saved in the eyes of God. Continuing on, the next thing is confession. Now, in the baptism of John, they confessed their sins. But in the baptism into Christ, we confess our faith. And this is called in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12, the good confession. Paul tells Timothy, you made the good confession before people. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father, which is in heaven. So we're finding not only that baptism is immersion, we find that there's only one baptism, we find that the immersion is in water, we find that faith, 
repentance and confession are prerequisites before baptism. But now I want to take us into a little bit of a different area. I want to take us into the things related to Jesus about baptism. First of all, how was Jesus baptized? We know he was baptized in water because in Matthew chapter 16, uh, 3, verses 16 and 17, Jesus came up out of the water. And after he came up out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Remember this, because this is going to be similar to what Peter preaches in Acts and chapter 2. In John chapter 3 and verse 5, remember what happened to Jesus, baptized in water, then he was given the Holy Spirit. Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 5, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. This is what happened with Jesus. And this is what Jesus is telling Nicodemus. Continuing on, in Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16, he commands baptism. This is called the Great Commission. He who has believed and has been baptized shall be saved. And these are the words of Jesus. Let's take a look at the words of Peter, his apostle. On the day of Pentecost, he said, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the baptism of Jesus. How did it happen with Jesus? He was baptized in water, and when he came up out of the water, God gave him the Holy Spirit. In his case, it was without limit. But in our case, we're baptized in water, and then we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't empower us with miracles like God did with Jesus. But that's the same order, water, spirit, water, spirit. Same order, just like Jesus commanded Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and verse 5. Let's go to something else that Peter said. When Peter went to preach to the Gentiles for the very first time, once he knew that God approved that Gentiles could become Christians, here's the very next thing he said. He ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's look at something else that Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. He said, baptism now saves you, not the removal of dirt from the flesh. We're not taking a bath physically but an appeal to God for a good conscience. That's parallel to forgiveness of sins. That's parallel to having our sins washed away. And these are some of the things that Peter had to say about baptism. Let's look at only a few things that Paul had to say about baptism. Do you remember? He had seen and talked to Jesus. He now goes to Damascus. Jesus said, go into Damascus and there it will be told you what you must do. He's now in Damascus. For three days he fasts. For three days he prays. And now finally somebody is being sent to him to tell him what he must do. And here is what Paul said, I was told. Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins calling on his name this is a powerful passage remember he had seen Jesus in a, in a message he had fasted for three days he had been praying for three days he had acknowledged Jesus as Lord but he still had his sins he still had his sins. How do we know? Because he was told to be baptized so his sins could be washed away. But that's not all that Paul has to say about baptism. In Galatians 3 and verse 27, he says, All of you who have been baptized into Christ. How do you get into Christ? All of you who have been baptized into Christ have clothed 
yourselves with Christ. How did Paul tell people he got into Christ? I was baptized into Christ. But that's not all Paul has to say about baptism. In Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, he says, Don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him in baptism and raised with him to walk in newness of life. When did Paul believe? that he finally got to walk with Christ in newness of life? The answer, after he had been baptized to share in the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. That's how Paul got into Christ. Now, what are we baptized into? And I want to take you back to Acts chapter 2 and look briefly at just four passages. Number one, this is not the Acts yet. We'll get there in a moment. Number one, Jesus came and he preached that the kingdom is at hand. I reworded that. The kingdom's on its way. In fact, we find that in Mark chapter one, 9 and verse 1, he said, There are some of you who are standing here who will not taste of death until... You see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. The kingdom of God has come. It came in the lifetime of some of those standing there. Who was standing there? The apostles. Were any of them dead before the kingdom came? Yes. What was his name? Judas. The kingdom came on the day of Pentecost with power. And Jesus said, There's some of you who are standing here who will not be dead until you see the kingdom of God come with power. And that's not all he said. He said in Mark 16, verses 18 and 19, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And to the apostles he said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. And the apostles on the day of Pentecost took those keys and each one of them were opening up the door of the kingdom to the Jewish people. The only sermon we have recorded is Peter's, but the rest of them were preaching. The text tells us they were hearing the apostles speak in their own languages. And that's the kingdom coming. That's the power Jesus had predicted. Now, let's follow that through a little bit as to what happened on that day. Once the sermon was preached that we have recorded, once the people said, what do we need to do? Here's what Peter told them. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. What happens next? All who received his word were baptized. What happens next? All those who believed were together. Do you see what's happening do you see what's beginning to take shape? The local church, as we know it, was beginning to take shape. How do we know? The Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. Folks, in the New Testament church, people are not voted into the church. They are added to the church when they are baptized for the remission of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. They are added into Christ, Galatians 3, 26, 27, Romans 6, 3, and 4, and a number of other passages that I've chosen not to add today because I'm watching the clock. But do you see what's beginning to take shape? It is the church, the local congregation. So I ask the question, who are these people? And Acts chapter 5 tells us, it is the church. It is the church Jesus said he would build. That is what is taking shape. That's what's happening on the day of Pentecost. That's what is continuing to happen. For you see, God adds those who are baptized scripturally to the church Jesus built. Not to some man-made denomination, 
not to some overruling organization, not to some convention, not to some council, but to the church that Jesus said he would build. I want to take you through a lot of verses, and they're on your page, and I'm not even going to read their location. I'm just going to read some names. The Bible talks about the church in Jerusalem, the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria, the church at Antioch, elders of the church at Ephesus, the church in Caesarea, the church in Ephesus again. The church in Sincrea, the church in Corinth, the churches of Galatia, the church at Philippi, the church at Thessalonica, and even the book of Revelation is written and addressed to the seven churches of Asia. These were local congregations. <laughs> what is the church that Jesus built? Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 and 23 the church is the spiritual body of Jesus this is why you cannot have a personal relationship with the head outside of the body Amen. his church because it is his body that's what people are added to when they're baptized into the body of Christ it's the church Jesus built. That's what it is. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Or Colossians 1 and verse 18. He is the head of the body. The church. The church. When I was younger, I had people say to me, Jesus, yes, the church, no. They didn't know what the church was. They thought they could have a relationship with the head outside of the head's body, which is his church. I get frustrated. I just want a personal relationship with God. I don't need a church. I don't want a church. I just want it to be me and Jesus and God, just us alone. Jesus didn't die for us to be alone. He died so we can be part of his spiritual body. He did not die so the people in Jerusalem could all be separate and set apart. Even the organization that he set up through scripture that the church would have elders and deacons and evangelists. This is that coming together of God's people in the church that he built. Not a denomination but one that follows the word as he has revealed it in the New Testament. I'm going to read all of this passage to you because it contains a lot of things about the wonderful nature of the church. I only have eight pages of notes today. You'll be glad to know I'm on the last page. I want you to listen carefully because what Paul is really talking about is the church. But he uses the illustration of marriage to talk about the relationship, husband and wife, Christ, and the church. You see, the church is the bride of Christ. K is my bride, husband, wife. Church, bride, Christ. Room. That's what he's talking about. Listen to what all he says about the church and how could anyone say Jesus yes and the church no after reading this passage. The husband is the head of the wife, here we go, as Christ also is head of the church, he himself, here's another one, being Savior of the body. What does Christ save? He saves his body, the church. That's what this says. Listen again. As Christ is head of the church, he himself being 
the Savior of the body. But as Christ is subject, I mean, as the church is subject to Christ, another point, application, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives. But here's the point. Just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church. Who did Jesus die for? According to the Bible. He died for the church. Who's the church? It's his spiritual body. Who's in his spiritual body? Those who have been baptized into Christ scripturally. That's who the church is. That's who we have got to be. And brothers and sisters, if we're not trying to be that church, we have no right to exist. Now we can exist as a social club, that's fine. We could have a campers club here because we have several people who like to go camping. We could have a campers club, but that ain't gonna save us. Jesus didn't die for a campers club. He died for his church. He died for the body. He died for those who are baptized into him scripturally and those who will live for him in the body of Christ. This is why it makes perfect sense when we read Matthew 6 and verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God, that's the church, and his righteousness, that's holy living in the church. Folks, that's what we're about. That's our number one purpose in life. The kingdom of God, his church, his body, and our holy living in this world. I continue reading. He gave himself up for her, verse 25. Why? Listen. So that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. This is the church. This is the church Jesus came to build. This is the kingdom that he said would come into being in, with power in the lifetime of some of those apostles. In fact, 11 of them. This is why the question is so important. Have you been baptized the right way for the right reason? into the church Jesus built? <coughs> Absolute essential questions that our world, much of Christianity, says is not necessary. You do not need to be baptized into Christ. You can get into Him some other way. But that's not what Scripture says. Here's what it looks like. Here's a person who is out of Christ because that's where lost people are. Saved people are in Christ. Here is the circle that represents the saved who are in Christ. Now, who is in Christ in the New Testament? Well, it started off with the church of Jerusalem, didn't it? From Jerusalem spread to Antioch. From Antioch, spread to Caesarea. There was a church in Caesarea. There was a church in Antioch. There was a church in Jerusalem. There's also a church in Claremore. There's also a church in Broken Arrow. There's also a church in Catusa. And there's a church in Inola that's trying to be nothing more and nothing less than the church Jesus built. Amen. Preaching and teaching that the way you get into that church is the same way they got into the church at Jerusalem. Teaching that the doctrines that those churches teach must be the same doctrine revealed in Scripture, the New Testament specifically. Now, 
Here's a person who is lost. They live in Inola. And they're baptized into the spiritual body of Christ. The church that Jesus died to save. And folks, that church has to be us. Because if it is not us, if we are not that church, who are we? Who are we trying to be? We can't bring in things from the Old Testament, even though once they were God's will for the Jewish people, not the Gentiles. We can't bring things in from paganism. Just as God built a border around Mount Sinai and essentially said, do not cross that line. God says the same thing to us when it comes to teaching things that are not found in Scripture or things that are contrary to Scripture. Don't cross the Scriptural line. Stay with the Word of God. Let the New Testament be your God. Don't set up some kind of central organization. Don't set up some kind of council that makes new rules for the church. Stick with the Word. Amen. Stick with the organization of the church. Let each church be autonomous. You can work together fine, but you can't rule one over the other. And yet, this is common. This is common. One preacher was moved from this town within the last month because headquarters said it's time for him to move. So he did. If he hasn't, he will. Headquarters. Oh, yes, we have a headquarters. It's in heaven. It's in heaven alone. That's where headquarters is. That's why we pray to our headquarters. That's why we send our petitions there to the throne of God through our high priest, Jesus Christ. Because that's the headquarters for the church that Jesus built. And here is what that looks like. Jesus said, I will build my church that's the church we want to be. What other would we want to be? What would we want to add to be something different? Don't we want to be the church that Jesus built? Not something similar to it. Not something that wears its name. Period. But something that is striving with all of our heart to be the church that Jesus built no more and no less getting into this church the same way they did in the New Testament days by hearing the word of God by believing it by repenting of our sins by confessing our faith in Jesus and then being buried with him in baptism to walk in newness of life so we go back to the beginning have you been baptized in the right way? Immersion in water. Have you been baptized for the right reason? So that your sins will be forgiven. And have you been baptized into the church Jesus built? Or some church that adds things that are not contained in the New Testament. Takes away things that are, that are contained in the New Testament. That's a question we each must answer. Not to me. Not to me. But to God. <clears throat>